Uh, project I've moved uh, just a few, two days over because of some demand there for timing. So if you hand in on the 12th, that's okay, but uh, if you hand in on the 14th still. Uh, the fourth assignment has been posted yesterday and it's due on the 19th. And uh, so that's shifted as well. Just, I just want you to focus on your project and not try to do two things at the same time. And then there's also the 4N big project coming in through the middle of that. So that will spread things out a little bit for people. Um, then the midterm solutions are posted as of two, three days ago. So that's also there for you to review on your own time, as well as the review that I did in class about two weeks ago. So uh, lots to, to keep you busy during the next few weeks, I know. So we're just trying to spread this out and balance a little bit. There is still a fifth assignment. I believe that's now uh, as a result of bumping of four along Sign five is bumped along as well, and so that's due just prior to class um, ending. So that will be due on the third. I'll post the solutions on the third as well, so no late handouts for that final assignment. The last day of classes for this course is the Thursday, the fifth, and then you write your exam on the seventh. Okay, so one unfortunate side effect of the two day break is that there's no study gap in the question. Um, is the challenge part still due on November? Yes, challenge project still given. And he wants sixty percent of it by Thursday then or no? So he done once. He wants said in terms that if we put in the challenge project, we should have at least sixty percent of it done by the Yeah, that's at your own pace, right? If you're going to compress it up for yourself then that's Oh so we don't need to give you anything. Though. No, I mean I'm relying on you to you know, to spread out your time. So let's go back to uh, our discussion in yesterday. On this example, so we were looking at uh, just recapping some of these, the use of these diagrams from chemistry and so forth. And we had said that if you take a mixture of pure solvents, so this is my corner point over here, and I mix it with a feed, and this feed is now 24% of solute and 70% 70 carrier, that's this point F. I know that the mixture will lie somewhere along that red line connecting. So we've got coming in here solvent S and E F. This is being well mixed in this system. Then we said yesterday we can calculate, and we showed yesterday rather, we can calculate the extract stream concentrations as well as the rapid stream concentrations, E and R. And now I will put subscripts on these E1 and R1 because what we're going to do later on is we're going to hook up these to another unit and then we'll call those E2, R2, and so forth. So we've got solvents and, and uh, picking up the solute. And once I let this mixture settle, that solute will separate into the two phases. There will be some amount of solute in my extract. In this case, we showed yesterday that there's going to be 33% of my extract uh, phase. That organic phase is going to be 33% of that is solute. And my raffinate leaving, so that's usually my aqueous phase or in my carrier, is only going to be 10%. So we left in the class by asking you to calculate what the mass is that leaves now in R1 and U1. So we knew that our feed here coming in was 250 kilograms per hour. <coughs> and my solvent coming in was 100 kilograms. <coughs> what is the mass leaving? in the extract stream and what is the mass leaving in the, in the rapid stream. So those numbers are shown up there. Anyone calculated this to, to verify? And what is the approach to calculate? Okay, specifically, what, are, what elements in the Lieber rule are being used? Or you can do the whole thing, E1 to R1. Or you can do the whole thing, E2 to R2. 
Well, let's see what the other side is going to be. If that's M R one. This is E one. So this is mass of E one. Okay. Now, if I choose the distance E one to M, then this denominator here is going to be R one. R one. Okay. So I still have two unknowns. One equation. I guess we need a whole thing to put in total. Okay, so that's a, the, we can use a, a, a choice of a lever rule, E1 to R1, and then that denominator here is mass M, okay, so 350 kilos. So appropriate choice of the lever rule makes the life a little easier. Uh, so you can go measure those two distances, M to R1. And when I did it, I had 31 millimeters divided by 85 millimeters. So times 350 kilograms gets you E1. Okay, and that's the 128. You can then calculate the R1 by difference. So R1 is then 350 minus 128. Because our mixture was 350 kilograms, it was split out into the two. Or you can just apply the legal rule a second time. Okay, everyone clear on that calculation? You're going to get a chance to try it out again later on this morning. Um, so the next concept I'd like you to consider is what's happening to my solvent? Okay, so, I'm oh, sorry, to my solvent. Do I have any solvent coming in over here? Yes. Not in this particular case. So my solvent coming in is pure solvent. There's no A in it. But how much solvent do I have? Sorry, how much solute do I have coming in in F? Okay, in mass. What we're trying to do is we're going to do mass balances around and see what's happening to that solute. So mass of solute in my feed. Sixty kilos. Okay. So sixty kilos of solvent, uh, solute coming in in my feed stream. F. So nothing coming in, in my 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 solvent stream. What's leaving then in my extract versus my raffinate? Solute is leaving in the extract versus the raffinate. We have 22.2 kilograms of the raffinate, and the remainder of the value of solutes leaving in the extract. of 
residual solvents. It's all just inaccuracies on the diagram. Okay, so every, this always tricks people up. Uh, you'll get different answers depending on how accurately you read your diagram. I bet you most of you probably have slightly different numbers than these. If you did this by uh, hand and read it off the diagram, you'll read slightly different values. You'll get a slightly different R1 and an E1 depending on how you accurately read off on your lever rule. And as a result, it's no surprise that you end off with those discrepancies in your mass balance. So if someone had calculated this one first and then reported this by difference, they would have got alternate answers. Okay, so this makes uh, life a little bit of a problem for us. And in fact, you kind of had it nice in chemical engineering up to now, but the moment you start working, you'll see this in reality. You measure flow coming in and you measure flow leaving, <coughs> your flow balances will never add up. So the flow meters lie to you, the calculations lie to you. There's always some sort of discrepancy. So we're seeing that discrepancy here. At best, we can try to massage the numbers to kind of make it balance out. But in general, we'll just leave it as is. This, this is just the inherent in working of the graphical method. The next question is, you're looking at the system and you're trying to ask yourself or judge whether this is a good separation. So how do you go and quantify this? How can you judge whether this is any good? For example, you may be using one particular solvent and tomorrow you're going to try a different solvent. How are you going to tell whether one solvent is better than the other? What do you have to consider? Do you compare the DA values? DA values. Can we calculate those? Okay, so that's one option. Consider the DA values. Anything else you consider? say that this is a good separation. I like always want to quantify, I think back to the project, I want you to start thinking like along these lines of your career as well. How good is this? How can I judge the performance of the system? What, would, what measure would you come up with? Sent recovered. Okay, so we'll call this recovery. And recovery then is defined either on the basis of, as I've shown you there, the extract stream, or you can define recovery on the basis of the raffinate stream. So it's the same, same thing, but in this case, we're actually going to get two different answers because our mass balance doesn't balance. So let's take a look at both definitions of recovery. One way you could say is my recovery is equal to Ye, the amount of solute A in the extract stream multiplied by the mass flow of the extract. So what you end off with divided by what you start off with. So Y, uh, Xf, A times the E. So if you do it on that basis, you'll get 0.33 times 128 divided by 24% of 250. So you get 
another way you could define recovery is you say it's simply based on the on the raffinate stream. So you can say one minus x r a times r divided by x f a <coughs> again divided by q. So the denominator is the same over here. But then you base it on the raffinate stream. And if you use this particular notation, you get 1 minus 0 0.22 times 100 divided by 0.24 times 250 again. And this time you get a recovery of 63%. Okay? So different recovery values. You would have got them agreeing exactly if your mass balance had balanced. So if those red figures over there did add up to 60, these two method, methods would give you the same number. But our mass balance doesn't have balance, so we get recoveries. So which one do you tell the boss? <coughs> <laughs> okay. So recovery then is defined in that intuitive way. Now you look at the system and you say, well, I'd like to change that around a bit. What, what can you change? If you want to improve this, so change it by some way, change the extract versus raffinate compositions, what degree of freedom do you have to vary? Your feed rate, maybe? Okay, so the, the feed amount, okay. So let's, uh, let's consider the case where you, you have to deal with a certain feed. Right? You don't have that, that freedom. What can we change though? Solvent, okay. So more solvent or less solvent? Yeah. Less solvent we use here. Oh. Good 
Pick up your line. Okay, you're that side. You're the furthest. Okay, so from the lever rule, we know that if we decrease the solvent, S is smaller, so distance MF must become smaller. Okay, the lever rule tells me that. So left solvent, I move over here. So let's say I move to this point, which is conveniently on the tie line, just for illustration. So I use just less solvent, so I land up over there. What happens now to my extract line? Start with the Yeah, yeah. You land up over there for your extract. <coughs> so now you get higher percentage of solute in your extract. You also get a higher percentage of solute in your raffinate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we choose anything. Yeah. 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 So what do you do next? Check the recovery. Check the recovery, right? So they will change. Both will increase, but they won't increase at the same rate or ratio. So you will get a benefit of the product in some way. One, will, one, one side will go up, the other side will go down with it. So your concentration, you've got a much more concentrated extract stream. And that makes intuitive sense. If you use less solvent, then you've got a more concentrated extract stream. But you've also left some over in the raffinate. Okay, because you've used less solvent, there's not capacity to take up the solvent. So your raffinate is also a slightly higher concentration. Okay, so this makes makes some <coughs> intuitive sense over there. And in fact, is just a different way of discussing uh, question two on an earlier slide that I had skipped. Okay, so if you look back at question two later on, same same idea. I just prefer to use this example. Do you have a higher concentration, or you also have more mass? Well, the, the you'll have a higher concentration, but whether you have a higher mass, you're going to actually have to do the calculation. Okay, so and you will do this in, in not in the next assignment, but in assignment five you can do this, or you can just try it out yourself at home. Pick, pick a point over there, see what your mass is on, and do your calculations for recovery. What's another way we can quantify the separation? Any other ways we've learned? Right? Selectivity. Selectivity. How do you define selectivity? I think that's the same with Marina said, that distribution value. So yeah. what's the preference for one phase to take on the other phase? What's another general number we've learned about throughout the course? The separation factor. Okay. So the separation factor is another where you can quantify any separation. It applies to any unit we've studied. And in this particular example, remember the separation factor is SIJ. You have to pick I and J. What are the two factors? What are the two I's and J's you pick here? <laughs> We've got three species, two streams. What do we pick now for separation factor? Would it be uh, well? Be, one would be your solute for sure, and then I think the other one would be solvent. Okay. Um. I was going to say carrier because the solvent <laughs> you're assuming is going to be in one stream. You don't want your carrier to go into your solvent okay. stream. So you're looking at how much solute switches over and how much carrier does not. Does not, okay. So we're going to be interested exactly the right to say how much solute has been picked up by my solvent and you don't want your carrier to be picked up. So look at the, the separation factor of solute relative to carrier, leaving in your extract stream versus your raffinate stream. Okay, so there's a, there's a, that question comes up on the assignment as well if you compute the separation factor. And, uh, you can do it on this, this particular instance as well, quite easy. So you simply remember the separation factor simply uses mass fractions or mole fractions or molar flows or mass flows, whatever you pick, as long as you're consistent. So here we've already got our mass fractions. All the information is here to compute the separation factor. So give that a go in your own time. Uh, look back at your separation factor definition as well. A few of you seem to be a little unclear about that. Is, but here, the, the key is we'll do the separation factor of solute relative to carrier. That's what we're interested in. Remember, our goal is, with this whole system, is to move the solute out of the carrier into the solvent. So that's why we would use solute versus carrier. 
Okay, so let's take a look now at this next question, which asks how our performance is. So you've looked at the system and you saw, saw here, started off with 60 kilograms, 40 odd ended up in your extract, which is exactly where you want it to be. But you've left 20 odd behind, right? You're going to throw this away. Dump it down the sewer. Recycle it where? Get to here. Another stage. Okay, so this is going to become the feed for our next stage. So e R1 is going to become the feed for our next stage. What do I add on to the diagram to do that? Do I have to start a new diagram from scratch? Yeah, so now R1 becomes your feed. Yeah. Okay. So go ahead and add that to your diagram. So what we're doing is exactly that. We're going to take this wrapping it on. The key point here is we're going to use a fresh solvent. So notice this solvent coming up here. This is a new batch of solvent coming in. Same composition as before. figure out what is going to be the extract composition and the raffinate composition leaving the second stage. percentage to be more than a certain value, so you can adjust the solvents to get exactly where you'd like it to be. So it's similar to that question we considered before, and here I've presented three options for you. Okay, so green line this time, so just to make it a little less cluttered, I've taken the previous M line away, the red line. We're only looking at the second stage now. I'm starting with fresh solvents, I'm going to blend it with R1. I can either blend a really small amount of solvent and I'll land up over there at that point E, or I can use a little bit more solvent and I'll land up at C, or I can use more solvent and land up at B. Notice what's what's happening in each case. It's high line. So this line shifts lower and lower every time. What's the implication of that? from the Rathmans concentration. 
doing work. Okay, so the more solvents I use, the lower and lower my output <coughs> graphene concentration is going to be. So that makes that makes a little bit of intuitive sense. If I flow a lot of solvent in, in over there, I'm providing capacity for that solute to be picked up by that high volume of solvent. So more solvent coming in, I move from D to C to B. B is my high solvent case, D is my low solvent case. So the raffinate concentration will get lower and lower and lower. So you finally get to a point where you get a very small amount of solute leaving in the graphite. How easy is it normally to separate the solvent from like the, the product that you want? Because that yeah, you pick that solvent so that it has an easy separation from the capacity object. Okay, but let's take a look back here. What's also happened if I've gone to higher and higher amounts of solvent? So D is low solvent. So D is less solvent than C, which is less solvent than B. What's happening to my extract? Yeah, less and less mass of solute in that extract stream as well. Okay, so you don't get something for nothing. You get, this is great, we want, want this. We want my raffinate concentration to get lower and lower. But the concentration of my extract is also getting lower and lower. That's not necessarily bad. If you grab more solid, the concentration is going to be going up, but you don't need to be extracting more. That's right. So, it's like, so, so like you have to check that. Like the Again, you have to come back and calculate this percentage. So this, this is why I introduced this concept. Being able to measure the performance of our system is critical. Right? So we want to understand how we can quantify the system numerically. Is option B a better option than D? Can we come up with some number to judge the performance of the system. Okay. So at D we can go calculate our recovery percentage, at B we can go calculate our recovery percentage and make an informed decision. Rather than sit back and look at this and say, yay, this is great, I'm getting better R, but worse E. Okay. Well, we can then quantify it much better if we come up with the performance. Okay, a few people confused still? I have a good question. Yes. Why do we care about the raffinating. Like, why don't you just try and get the highest amount of students in the extra and forget about the raffinating? Like, why do we really care about the raffinating? We want more students. Anyone want to answer that? Jeff? Because if your raffinating concentration is higher, wouldn't you be throwing away more solute? Which is not what you want. And that's your desired product. And if you want it, then it must be valuable. You want to get it all. Yeah, this is what we want to recover <coughs> is that, that amount. That 22 kilos is valuable to us. So if, our, if all we're going to do is maximize E1 and leave stuff behind in here, that's not good either. So this is a little counterintuitive at first because you're seeing both numbers drop. Okay, but at the end, you have to go, these are simply, the, what's throwing you off is the fact that these are simply mass fractions or percentages. So that's not always a good way to judge a system. Judge it based on the mass amounts. So if we go calculate the relative amounts of mass left behind at all three cases, we can make a far more informed decision. Um, you get to a point where pretty much the tie line doesn't fly. Yeah. Right? Okay. If you in the last one, pretty much fly. Yeah, you can bring this line even lower still by adding a huge amount of salt. Yeah. Okay. What would that mean? Are you separating it? You're just yeah. simply just diluting all the system. You're throwing in so much solvent. Like you could bring this purple line really low by bringing in such a large volume of solvent that essentially you're leaving here. Yeah, it is a low concentration, but simply because you've added so much solvent to dilute it out. Oh, right. It's not, again, you have to go back to mass. Yeah, go back to mass. Okay. How did we get this curve in the first place, this black arc? So you're sitting here, you have to separate a solute from a particular carrier. 
you choose a solvent and you go to Perry's and you find by happy coincidence this triangular picture for your case? No. Never. <laughs> so you're sitting to, needing to solve to separate a solute A from your carrier C. You've picked an A solvent that you think might work based on colleagues' knowledge, someone with some first principles chemistry knowledge. Now you don't have this information, you don't have this code, you don't have any of those tie lines. How do you go about getting the data? Okay, pay someone money. Yeah, you go ahead and do it. Oh, what do you tell them to do? What do you tell your lab technician if you're not going to do the work? Or your graduate students? See how different concentrations, um, when you put certain concentrations together, like how it resolves, like how many phases you get. Okay. So, like we had in that little video uh, in the previous class, you go mix up <coughs> concentrations, known concentrations, and you let them separate. So, start with the concentration at points in this area, let them separate and see where they land up. And then you get, you'll accumulate various data points that form that black arc. Okay. What is that point P, this plate point over there? Right, so your tie lines move in this diagonal direction. If you keep going there, what's happening to your tie lines? What's going to happen if I just start to approach that point? and then just move a little bit further beyond it. Okay, so at this particular point, there's no separation. And what can you say about the composition of the two phases when there just is a separation? Same composition in both phases. If you go just a little bit beyond that, you get a single phase of whatever composition. Just a little bit away from it, you do get separation, but those phases are just slightly different composition. At the point, the composition of the two phases are equal to each other. So as you do those experiments in your lab, you may uh, fall on that plate point. So what I'd like you to take a look at next, I'm going to hand out a different system for you to try. Again, there should be enough copies for everyone to take two. You can use one in class, one to take home. Um, and it's also posted as a PDF on the course website. And what you're going to do is work through this uh, question over here. So this is not in your notes. This is a practice question for us to work on in the next few minutes. And you try it on a different system. This one has some interesting differences over the previous one. So there should be enough for two for everyone. Calculate the composition of the mixture. That's an easy one. 
The one that might take a little bit more thought is, where's your extract, where's your raf in it? And what are their compositions and particular flows of E1 and R1? I 
never like to be like this. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my Thank you. 